Welcome back. We did the magic formula screening video a couple weeks ago and one of the stocks that jumped out to me was this one, Jack Specific. So it looked really cheap at first glance. I wanted to do a deep dive into it. So that's this deep dive, right? So I'll recap a couple things we talked about in the magic formula video. This one actually has run up pretty significantly in the last year. So usually magic formula stocks will not have this big increase because you know they're they're supposed to be value stocks right so usually the, the stock's history is that you know it, it's fallen recently this one's up 60 percent okay so i'm usually not a big fan of buying stocks that have run up 60 percent in the last year but you know i can be persuaded right um actually some of my big winners had all run up beforehand all right um just high level the financials the the big thing was that this is a $34 stock right and your free cash flow per share where is it free cash flow per share you know at first glance nine dollars seven dollars uh for the covid recovery you know minus two nine four. okay so you're talking nine dollars of free cash flow selling for thirty dollars a share okay that's what initially made me want to d dive into it more I also uh will show you there there's really no Debt on the balance sheet. So um, let's see, current liabilities 250 long term, zero long term debt here, right? Okay, so that's all well and good, um, but I want to do a further deep dive into the financials. I can show you their their toys. I mean, that they're, they're a toy company, but you know, that's what's more important is the financials, right? I'm not going to sit here and try to uh, determine if this Elsa doll is going to beat out Barbie next year or if Sonic is, I don't, you know, who, who knows that, right? We're, we're looking strictly at the financials. And even if one company has a, a, I guess, an advantage from the sales side, you know, they could be handling their money poorly, that sort of thing. Dress up and role play. Look at this. This one's, I just thought this was funny. They, they sell shopping cart, cart toys. I don't know. I don't know why I think that's funny, but just do okay anyway let's go into the financials so income statement i'm starting with the pre-tax income look this is going back to june 2005 now they had a major restructuring in 2019 they converted a lot of debt to equity there was new ownership uh, they brought on a new cfo so i'm going to change my scale i'm going to just uh start the count let's see in 2018 okay so we're going to just look 2018 onward um for the income statement okay so look at this pre-tax income i mean since that restructuring i mean really they've been growing earnings you know so um you got to be careful here i want to try to split the difference if you're looking at this visually because you got a lot more weighting the bottom here so you know well you know what we're going to do we're just going to sum up the last four quarters so the last four quarters sum to um 45 million dollars so on a yearly basis making about 45 million dollars of pre-tax income i've told you before great rule of thumb just multiply that by 10 to get to like fair value so i'll do that 45 times 10 is 450 million and then you can ratio that to the market cap to get a stock price so if you look up in the top right the market cap is 346 so divide by 346 and then multiply by the share price. So 34.34. And you can see that roughly $44, $45 a share is probably fair value. That is very high level. I wouldn't go buy a stock off of that, but that's a good screener. Uh, you also want to apply a margin of safety to that later on. But anyway, so it is at first glance looking still a little undervalued. Um, the free cash flow was a lot higher than this, though, and we'll get to that balance sheet there's a few things i want to point out so i thought this was so interesting so look at this tangible book value so they just had a, a giant crash you know and then they had the restructuring and now since then the tangible book value has just been rising i really do like to see a rising tangible book value really rising equity because i feel like unless you're paying dividends the math doesn't work out that um you can't be doing good and have the your net equity rising, right? So what do I mean by that? Um, I should say equity per share. So if a company is keeping all the cash that it earns, then the cash has to be going somewhere. It's either buying new businesses or um, investing in itself or just growing a cash balance on the balance sheet or paying down debt, let's say. All of those things 
or repurchasing shares. I forgot about that one. Everything except dividends, let's say, keeps the money internally to where it'll show up in your tangible book value per share calc. So, you know, if you're paying down debt, that's going to reduce your liabilities, make this higher. If you're buying back shares, then it'll reduce your tangible, or it'll reduce the number of shares, which increases TBV per share, which I don't have here. I just have plain TBV, TBV, but it is what it is. One thing that does concern me is the total number of shares. So in general, I like companies to be uh, buying back shares, which would mean that the number of shares is decreasing and they're kind of doing the opposite. I'm really just looking at this period, right? The 2020 onward, they, um, this is part of their recap where they had to do a bunch of share dilution, but even then they're still diluting shares. Um, so it's just something that goes against, it's a red flag in my opinion. All right. So for the cash flow statement, I like to look at the big three, you know, operating cash flow, financing cash flow, investing cash flow. And look, I started this one around, I think 2018. So operating cash flow has got that same pattern as the pre-tax income, which is good. Uh, one thing I want to look at always is the stock based compensation. So, you know, what percentage of their operating cash flow is getting inflated due to stock-based compensation. Basically what's going on is that if they're paying employees or management in stock, they get to add that back to the cash flow. So it will inflate the cash flow number uh, because it's not a real cash expense, except it is an expense to the shareholder. So it's something I like to look at because uh, if it's high enough that we need to account for it. Oh, let me see. What what are we at now? Oh, wrong thing. Let me go back. What was our operating cash flow? It's like roughly, let's just say 30 million a quarter. That seems high, huh? Let me just sum the last four. Summing the last four is uh, 20. Okay, so an average of 25 a quarter. So right at $100 million a year of operating cash flow. Okay, $100 million a year. Stock-based compensation is roughly two per quarter. Okay, so that's eight. I know I'm going fast, but okay, two times four, eight million dollars in stock-based compensation a year. And I said that the um, operating cash flow is roughly a hundred million dollars, so it's going to be eight percent, right? Eight divided by a hundred. Eight percent of your operating cash flow going to stock-based compensation. I prefer that lower, um, like in the one, like under five or like one to two percent, but. Just something else. Um, that's probably what's causing, or it is what's causing that share dilution that we saw in the balance sheet for sure. You know, they're they're giving away two million dollars a quarter in stock-based compensation on a three hundred million dollar stock. Let's see what is that. So every quarter, so two divided by the current market cap three forty six, half a percent or 0.6 percent. What I'm doing here is seeing, you know, what percent are they diluting every quarter? So. 0.6% every quarter or per year that they're diluting by 2.3%. That's like a, it's like having something lose 2.3% on its own, right? So don't love that uh, as a shareholder. Not, I'm not a shareholder yet, but I wouldn't like that if I was a shareholder. Um, real quick, we'll look at financing cash flow. So financing, really, I'm just making sure that this is shrinking and negative right because that's financing cash flow is helping you out as a shareholder it's it's either paying debt they don't have any debt but um wait so what are they spending it on i guess they did it to to pay down debt let me see uh net debt issuance yeah that's what they did that they pay down debt with all their uh financing cash flow so now now it's time to buy back stock instead of you diluting it i hope all right, um, and then lastly, I want to look at free cash flow. Okay, so this is really good. Free cash flow is going to be, um, I mean, we saw that in the overview. It, it looks like you're, you're, you're at a two to three times free cash flow multiple um, based on trailing 12 months. Let's see, trailing 12 months is uh, $90 million of free cash flow. So $90 million of free cash flow divided by 346, that's a 26% yield on your free cash. I mean, that's that's incredible, right? Now, the question is, is that going to continue, right? And who knows? Um, that's where your uh, knowledge of the toy market comes in, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, I, 
I want to adjust it though. So first of all, it's very uh, volatile. What, what's the right word for this? That, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of noise in this graph. So I want to smooth it out by instead of looking at every quarter, look at trailing 12 months because that helps smooth out the curve, but it also um, it also keeps all the data points instead of just looking at every year. If you look at every year, you're going to get you know, only 25% of the data points that, that you get by looking at every quarter. But if you look at trailing 12 months, you'll get all the quarterly results, but it'll just smooth out the curve. All right, so this is the trailing 12 months, and then I took out stock-based compensation. So I want to know what the real free cash flow, as far as the shareholders concerned, is, right? So what's your, what's your free cash flow after the, uh, and then I'll, anyway. So what's your free cash flow, trailing 12 months minus stock-based compensation? Okay, so... This is an awesome look, right? I mean, this is what you want to see, you know, up and to the right. You want graphs up and to the right. Now, there's this trough here with uh, COVID that we saw. But uh, in general, this is really strong. And if it stays on this trajectory and, you know, you're talking making $80 million a year and growing in free cash flow, I mean, it's a no-brainer buy right now, okay? I don't even have to do a DCF to, to tell you that. Uh, the question is, is it going to continue. So what I want to do is take a little bit more conservative assumption. So I'm going to say, you know, what if they're making, what if they make 50 million? I don't know. What do you think? 40 or 50? I'll do both. Well, I'll, you know what? I'll do a 40 scenario and I'll do a 60 scenario and then we can, we can compare. Okay. So I'm going to go to my DCF. All right. So my DCF, uh, basically I have these five inputs, cash flow, then five-year growth, perpetual growth, discount rate, and then margin of safety. I use these two as 15 and 67%. That's always been my uh, my my two num inputs there because I like to compare apples to apples. That doesn't mean that that's what fair value is or whatever, but it helps whenever you're comparing two stocks against each other. And this margin of safety is... Uh, I guess in a way the margin of safety is actually 33%, not 67, but I like anyway. Okay, what did I say? Okay, $40 million. If they're making $40 million uh, a year in free cash flow, adjusted free cash flow, with no growth, then I have net present value at 266. This is the market cap, right? 266 and a target entry price of 180 million dollars so that's about half of the current value okay so that's that's pretty conservative i think the 40 is pretty conservative as well um if i change that to, and i have no growth assumptions up here both my growths are zero 60 million dollars a share now my net present value is 400 million dollars and the target entry price is 268 which is about i think 27 dollars a share if i can do that math right in my head it's pretty easy because the um, the stock price up here, if you look at the top right of the screen, the stock price is about one tenth of the market cap. You know, so if the market cap is 300, 340, then the stock price is 34. So you can think of these market caps if you want to get a, a estimate on stock price, just divide by 10. All right, what happens if I add some growth in there? Um, what I want to do, I should put minus 2% growth because that's the, well, no, I shouldn't do that because I'm already adjusting for it here. But I mean, this is significant. Uh, I mean, from 40 to 80 in two years, that's, that's crazy high. Uh, even if you did that in three years, that's 26% compounded growth to do that in three years. So, you know, you got to be careful. Don't assume that they're going to continue growing at this rate. But like, let's say that they still, let's say that they, they grow at 7% for the next five years. Okay. Now the equation changes tremendously. And then let's say perpetual growth at 2%. I mean, now you're talking target entry price above the current market cap, right? So, you know, a lot is riding on these assumptions. And I think that's an important thing to know in uh, investing is that you're only as good as your assumptions. The, the, the math part's easy, right? Personally, on this stock, I am going to keep it on the watch list. I'm probably going to lean more towards the conservative end of that valuation. And I would love to see it drop significantly and see management decide that they want to start buying back shares with all their money that they're piling up supposedly now, right?
now that they have no more debt to pay down. Anyway, that's just my thoughts. I hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you learned something. Like, subscribe. Email me if you want a copy of this DCF page for, for yourself. And uh, I'll see you next time.